book of Judges, chapter 5. It says it's the song of Deborah, if you have your Bibles and if you can see what the chapter is all about. It's a song of victory. And it says it's the song of Deborah. It's a very interesting story. And uh, I've captioned my uh, sermon uh, for today as uh, Rise Up. Rise Up uh, as the title of my sermon. And uh, we're not going to go through the whole uh, song, the whole song of Deborah. Uh, but we're going to pick up some important verses. And I believe that's the message that the Lord has for us today. Okay. Um, I'm going to read the very last verse of this passage. The very last verse. That's Judges chapter 5 verse 31. So this is what it says. Lord, may all your enemies die like Sisera. But may those who love you rise like the sun in all its power. May they who love you be like the sun that rises in its strength. Those who love you will be like those who rise like the sun in all its power. It's a beautiful allegory or you call it as an imagery or a picture. You know, what the Bible says is that God's people will rise. They will rise like the sun in all its splendor. They will rise like a sun which rises with all its strength, with all its brilliance, right? So you can, you can imagine when the sun rises, when it spreads its early rays right at the dawn. It's so powerful, right? Because, uh, because the whole night has been quite black, you know, and, uh, and right after the, the blackness of the night, the sun rises. It, it's all its splendor. In its power. That's why it says, uh, you know, like a sun that rises in its strength. And nothing can um, the stop the, the brilliance of its, of its rays. Right? So it's after the gloom that the sun rises. So there was a period of gloom uh, in the time of the children of Israel. Right? So it says, like, let all your enemies be like Sisera. Let God's enemies be defeated. So the story is about... There was a time for a period of 20 years, you know, the nation of Israel was oppressed by a very powerful enemy. And his name is Sisera. That's what the story says. Right. And, uh, and he was in absolute control. And, um, and the people were under the bondage of this leader, this commander uh, called Sisera. And... Uh, and after 20 years of gloom, 20 years of cruelty, 20 years of oppression, 20 years of slavery, God's people are rising once again. There is, a, there is an amazing victory. God gave them victory over the enemy. And it's a supernatural, you know, intervention of God. It's a supernatural, miraculous, you know, manifestation of God's power. It's, it's a, sometimes there are many miracles we read in the Bible, but we miss out the miracle in this story. Because when you read the Bible, you have to very carefully read through the story. And then there is a miracle, nothing short of the miracle of the Red Sea or how God opened Jordan. So that's the kind of miracle that happens in this story. And it, it, is, it is purely God who, who, who steps in. Right. And, and then the people of God rise once again, right? Like the sun that rises in its strength. So it's an amazing story of God's miraculous power, right? So that's why the Bible says here, yeah, but those who love will rise up, will once again rise. God's people once again rise like the sun, you know, with all its strength. So a little bit of background to the story. Uh, you, I was telling about the enemy, right? God's enemy, people's enemy who have been oppressing, who have been, uh, uh, you know, uh, keeping 
Israel under bondage for 20 years. And this guy is Sisera. If you read Judges chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, you, can, you will get a little bit of, you know, an understanding to the background of this song of victory, the song of Deborah. Right in Judges chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. After Ehud's death, <coughs> the Israelites again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord turned them over to King Jebin of Hazar, a Canaanite king. The commander of his army was Sisera. He's the one I was talking about who lived in a place called the Hasharat Hagoim. Now, Sisera had 900 iron chariots. Listen to this very carefully. He had 900 iron chariots, ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. Then the people of Israel, the people of God, cried out to the Lord for help. So this is the man, Sisera, had 900 iron chariots, right? It's like, Imagine an army, you know, equivalent to 900 tankers, you know, military tankers. That's how powerful he was. That's how ruthlessly he oppressed uh, the nation. Now, you, you, you really, well, you know, you would probably uh, think, you know, how can a nation without, uh, you know, without an army? Because uh, Israel was at that time, during the time of Judges, uh, was a nation which had no king. They had no organized military structure. They did not have a, a leader, right? It's only 300 years later, they had their first king. It was King Saul, right? It was not a, a pretty organized nation. It did not have a king. It did not have an, have an army, right? And uh, there were no prophets. Nobody was leading them. And you would really wonder, how can a nation without a king, without a proper army? And the Bible says they did not even have a sword or a spear. Imagine no sword, no spear, no ammunition, no weapons to even fight. So how can Israel, a nation, a small nation, which did not even have uh, organized structural military uh, army, can defeat this Sisera who had 900 tankers, military tankers? I mean, it, it's, un, it's an unbelievable story. That's why I said it's the story of God's miracle. How could this happen? So... It's, it's a beautiful story. I'm not going to go into the, the passages. I'm going to just briefly give you what happened in the story. God summoned. God told the people, come on, all of you gather. You know, we are going to fight Sisera. And the people responded. You know, it's like mind boggling. That it's a small nation. You know, all of them just scattered all over the land. And God is saying, all of you come together. Let's fight this great leader called Sisera with 900 iron chariots. People People obey God. They said, okay, let's go. And God, the Bible says, the story says, he gathered all of them to a river called River Kishon. It's, a, it's an ancient river. And Sisera came with all his 900 chariots to the River Kishon. And then God showed up. The Bible says God, in a flash of a moment, turned the the silent river into a raging torrent. Something happened, you know. Uh, the, the scholars say apparently there was a cloud burst all of a sudden. And then, you know, there was the river turned into a raging mighty torrent. Uh, and what happened? Uh, and all those chariots wheel got stuck in that muddy water. You know? And Sisera and all the men, the soldiers had to abandon their 900 iron chariots. And they had to run for their life. And the story goes, you know, Sisera runs and finds himself, you know, a hiding place in a woman's tent, a woman called Jail. And you know what she did? She said, come on and, you know, I will keep you safe and gave him a blanket. And as he was sleeping because of his exhaustion, he was running for his life. She took a tent peg and a hammer and he nailed him. A woman, an ordinary housewife killed a great leader, a cruel tyrant who had 900 iron chariots, a housewife with a tent, a peg, and a hammer. And God gave victory. Amazing, unbelievable story, right? A story of glorious uncertainties. And then the day of gloom was over. 
God gave miracle, miraculous victory for his people, right? And the people of God risen in strength one more time. God gave them victory over an enemy who kept them in slavery for 20 years. So that's, that's, the, that's the summary of that song of Deborah. And then finally it concludes by saying that's what happens to people of God. That's what happens to children of God. You know, they will rise in strength. They will rise in power, right? So that's the message that I have for you this morning. And God is speaking to you, you know, uh, if, if there are times, you know, there are times in our life we go through times of pain, times of uh, difficulty, there are challenges in our life. Sometimes there are days of gloom, you know, but when you truly love the Lord, people who love the Lord, the Bible says, will rise again. We are not defeated people. We will rise again. It doesn't matter how big or how enormous our challenges are. You know, it doesn't matter how threatening our circumstances are. The Bible says God's people can rise above their circumstances. They will rise like a sun, sun that's shining in its radiant splendor with all its strength. And which will expel the darkness. That's what happens to God's people. After 20 years of gloom and defeat and failure, God's people rose again. Right? So I want, to, I want to bring this word this morning today and I want to encourage you that, that we will rise again. We will rise again with power. And God will give us, uh, give us this strength and power to overcome our circumstances and take victory. Now, the Bible says, all those who love God, all those who love you will rise like a sun in all its strength. Now, who are they? What is, what is this, this whole song is talking about? What is this whole passage is talking about? Who are the ones who love God, right? And that, that's, that's why I want to go a little bit deeper to make you understand, you know, who are the ones who, who take victory, who can enjoy God's victory, who can, who can experience God's miraculous, supernatural deliverance and provision in their lives? Who are the ones who witness God's miracles? Of course, it says those who love God, right? But who are the ones who really love God in this story, in this context? Okay, now I read to you the last verse of that passage. Now I'm going to read, read to you the very first verse. I'm going to connect these two verses and we, we unravel the story. I'm going to read to you the very first verse of Judges chapter 5. We just read the last verse of Judges chapter 5. I'm going to read you the first verse. Of course, the first verse is on that day, Deborah and Barak sang this song and then comes the verse. Okay, it says, when the princes in Israel take lead and when the People willingly offer themselves. I don't know what your translation says, but my uh, translation says, and Ivy says, when the people willingly offer themselves to God. When people willingly offer themselves to God, that's when God shows his miracles. Right. So who are the ones that the song of Deborah is talking about? Who are those people who love God? Who are those people who rise in power? Who are the people who rise in strength like the sun? Who are the ones who experience God's supernatural interventions? Listen to me carefully. People who willingly offer themselves to God. People who willingly offer themselves to God. That's, that's the story. That's the song. Now, I'm going to give you a few names. So the whole uh, song is a very interesting song. It's a song of victory, right? They are, they are just uh, uh, articulating uh, Deborah and uh, the other leaders who are there engaged in the battle. They are singing a song of victory and telling how God brought victory for his people, right? And the first verse tells it all happened because of the people who are willing to offer themselves to God. It's only through them God gives victory, right? So a few names I'm going to show you. Who are the ones who willingly offer themselves to God in this battle, in this battle against Sarah, right? So chapter 5, let's pick up a few names, verse 18. What does it say? 5 verse 18.
but Zebulun risked his life, as did Naphtali on the heights of the battlefield. Okay, these are familiar names. So these, so so God is talking about the tribes of Israel. You know, there are twelve tribes, twelve families. You know, they are all scattered all over the nation, and they have a common enemy. Who is the common enemy? Sisera. The man with 900 iron chariots who have been cruelly oppressing the whole nation for 20 long years. Okay? And then they are all fighting. They are all going to fight. But God is picking up few names and saying, these are the ones who willingly offer themselves to me. And in that, he is talking about two families, two tribal. And who are they? Zebulun and Naphtali. And God says... They risked their lives on the heights of the battlefield. So it means not everybody, not everybody came to fight the battle when God called them. Not everybody came. Only a few of them came. And in that God is, uh, you know, bringing out those names. God is mentioning those. He's very careful to mention those, those people who stood in the front line. So why does it say Zebulun and Naphtali risked their lives? Because it's not easy to challenge Sisera, right? Of course, God gave a miraculous victory, right? But who are on the front lines? Who are on the front line of the battle? Zebul and Naphtali. They didn't know what, they, they were not sure what was going to be the outcome. They just had the faith to believe because God has called them and said, let's go and fight the battle. They've all put their lives at risk and standing on the battlefield. God is saying, I know Zebul and Naphtali have risked their lives and they were there on the battlefield. They are the ones who offered themselves willingly for God, right? There are a few other names, right? Uh, you can trust me. I've read this passage over and over again. So I'm just telling you what is there in the Bible, right? Uh, there were a few other tribes. Issachar, God names another tribal family. Issachar, Benjamin, Manasseh. God says they all rallied around. They all came. They all came to fight the battle. God is mentioning few names. So these are the people who offer themselves to God. And there's something more interesting there. You know, even the forces of nature join the battle. Do you know? Even the forces of nature. Let's read verse 20. Just, just reading through a few verses, picking up here and there to get a grasp of the story. The stars fought from heaven. The stars in their orbits fought against Sisera. Wow. The stars fought against God's enemy. The forces of nature, the stars, the clouds, because there was a cloudburst, you know, and that's what turned the old, the ancient Kishon rivers all of a sudden into a raging torrent. Even God's creation, the forces of nature were engaged in the battle, were involved in fighting God's enemy. And then who else? If you read further down, you will know even the angel of the Lord was there. You know, probably you can read it that much later. The angel of the Lord was there. And above all, if you see, even God was there. Who was leading the army? Who was leading the army? It was God. The Bible says God was marching against, ahead of them, against Sisera. So God was there right there in the army. God was their leader. But make no mistake, there were only few of them. There were only few of them from the nation of Israel who willingly offered themselves to God. That's the story. That's the story what God is saying here. So, so who went into the battle? So the story is all about the people who willingly offered themselves for God. Right? Basically, if you go through this whole uh, you know, story of Deborah, uh, this whole story of, um, you know, God defeating judges. Basically, God is talking about two groups of people. One group who willingly offered themselves. He names those families, right? But the other group who stayed back, who did not offer themselves wholly to God. Who are they, right? There are a few names here in that same passage as well. Okay, let's get to that. To those names. Judges chapter 5 verse 15. Read the last part of that verse. Verse 15. But in the tribe of Reuben. 
there was great indecision verse 16 why did you sit at home among the sheep folds to hear the shepherds whistle for their flocks yes in the tribe of reuben there was great indecision so what was happening in reuben's family what was happening to the whole tribe of reuben there was great indecision it was very characteristic of reuben if you read the bible carefully you will know it was very characteristic of reuben because reuben was a man of bad decisions a man who always could not make the right decision you know right at genesis the father the head tribal head reuben reuben was the the, the oldest son of jacob right he was the he was the oldest one he was the leader of all the 12 tribes but you know what jacob said about reuben jacob said you are the reuben means the strength you know the beginning of my strength you are the one the leader of of all the 12 tribes all the families you are the you are the leader of all the 12 families right you are supposed to be my my first born you are supposed to be a man of honor excellence but you know you lost all of that reuben because you climbed onto your father's bed and defiled it i'm sure those who know the bible know the story well you know what reuben did he had sexual intimacy with his father's one of his father's wives so jacob was very disappointed a very bad decision right at the beginning so it was very characteristic of reuben and jacob says you are like uncontrolled you are unstable reuben sometimes it's it's the same character you know that just passes on from generation to generation sometimes the you know the weaknesses that your that your parents have the same weakness you will have the same fears that they have the same fear that you will have it's very characteristic sometimes we inherit all these qualities from our forefathers from our mothers from our fathers it's there right there in your blood it's very characteristic this great indecision he is not able to make a decision ruben maybe he's thinking oh it's so foolish how can we go and fight against sisera is it going to work in the first place and this guy has got 900 iron chariot it's going to is it possible to even fight against i mean it's a foolish venture probably or probably is still deciding whether to go or not to go you know because there are few families who have joined the battle great indecision verse 17 gilead remained east of jordan and why did dan stay at home gilead is god there's another tribe called god and dan so these are all tribal families these are all groups and groups of families god is saying why did you stay east of jordan that should ring a bell on you east of jordan why east of jordan remember the story of moses there are few families who didn't even cross the other side of jordan to come into the promised land you know why they said why don't you give this side of jordan you know as our promised land we will stay here moses said on one condition i will give you because you are not crossing over the jordan they did not cross over the jordan they did not actually come to the promised land they settled on the eastern side because of the vast number of livestock they had moses allowed them because he said on one condition whenever your brothers are going into the battle to fight the lord's battle you should join them they said yes we will do yes agreed there are families on the other side of jordan but you know when there was a battle and god is summoning the people to come they didn't because they are settled now they are at peace they have got their portion of blessing on the eastern side of jordan that belongs to them why should we join the battle because we are safe and secure we have our portion they did not keep the word that they promised the lord before moses asher i'm reading verse 17 asher sat unmoved at the seashore remaining in his harbor there's another family asher what did he do he sat unmoved at the seashore now that could should give you if you have the the, the map of the 12 tribe settlement this message will make a, a lot of sense to you if you have that in your bibles just flip over the last page you know where asher is 
His home was overlooking the sea. Wow, what a place to have your house. Overlooking the seashore. Man. So what are you doing sitting in your seashore, remaining in your harbor, doing business? Doing business, very busy. Aishar was very busy doing business because he was on the seashore. It was on the coastal line. Wonderful house. Overlooking the seashore, protecting his borders, doing business, very busy. He doesn't have time to respond to God's call. God is naming all. What are you doing? What are you? What is happening in the tent of Reuben? God knows. God knows what is happening in the tents of God. God knows what's going on in Asher's family. God knows. He sees all of it. And he says, these people did not join me. They did not join me. People of God, my sermon this morning is very simple. If you want to experience God's supernatural interventions and miracles in your life, if you want to be a people of God who will rise in strength, who will overcome your circumstances, who will experience God's miraculous divine interventions in your life, you've got to be a people who will be willing to offer yourself to God. That's my message. That's, that's the whole. I'm bringing up the whole story and connecting just one verse to the entire story. People who offered themselves to God. That's that simple, right? How to rise above your circle. How to rise. God, rise up. That's, that's the message. God's people should rise up. You should rise up to take hold of your blessing. You should rise up to take hold of your portion of inheritance. You should rise up to, to exercise your victory. You should rise up to receive what belongs to you. If you're going to sit there and do nothing, we might lose. Because God is looking. God knows what is happening in your home. God knows what's happening in your life. He knows what's exactly going on. Where was Zebulun? He knows where is Naphtali. He knows where is Reuben. He knows where is Asher. He knows every one of us. He's able to see. And he's saying, if my people who are willing to offer themselves are the ones who rise in all their glory and strength, right? So, a few pointers, yeah? One is the most important, the most important part of the messages. Don't forget, offer yourselves willingly to God. That's my message for you. Offer yourselves willingly to God. Okay, so uh, come back to the first verse, right? That's, that's where everything begins. That's the, that's the most important part of this whole story, right? Son of Deborah, Israel's princess, whatever your translation says. The princess in Israel took lead and when the people willingly offered themselves to God. There are some other translations, very interesting translations for that first verse. I was trying to see other translations because somehow there was a disconnect, I felt. So the NRSV translation says the same verse is translated like this. Instead of saying, princes of Israel taking their lead, it says, when locks are long in Israel, you're talking about the hair, the locks of hair. Or long in Israel. Okay. Now the another version. LEB says. When long hair hangs loosely in Israel. Hold on. Quite interesting. I'll come to the point. And there is a more accurate. Uh, you know. A Jewish version of the Old Testament says. When locks of hair go untrimmed in Israel. It's all talking about hair. Did you get the idea? It's all talking about your hair being loose. Your hair being grown and unkempt. Your hair being untrimmed. Now I want you to combine those two verses and read now. Does it make any sense? When hairs are untrimmed in Israel and people offer themselves willingly to God. Does it make any sense? When hair is grown long 
is a sign of wow. It's a sign of consecration. It's a sign of devotion. The Nazarites let their hair grow. They did not shave it. They did not trim it. It talks about devotion to God. Now it makes sense, doesn't it? When, when the locks are untrimmed and people offer themselves to God, there is a sense of devotion where people have devoted their lives to God, where people are diligently seeking God. They're, they have taken a vow. They have taken a vow before God and said, unless God shows up, why does God have to show up? All of a sudden, you know, he has not showed up for 20 years. Have you ever thought about it? 20 years of cruel oppression, God didn't show up. 20 years Sisera was oppressing and, 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 and destroying the land. of God never showed up. Why all of a sudden God has to show up? Because the, the people have begun to realize, unless God shows up, unless we seek him, unless we devote ourselves, they have taken up vows. They said, Lord, we need you. And then God shows up. And when he saw the devotion, when he saw those people of Israel, you know, of course they have sinned. Of course they have done all the mistakes. As a result of that, God has given them over. The, the protective borders have been removed and God has raised up an enemy. But now they have realized after 20 years of the time of gloom, after 20 years of, of gloominess, all of a sudden God rises and says, I am going to fight Sisera. I am going to give you victory. How does, how does that happen? When people willingly offered themselves, people decided to devote their lives to God. And then God begins to move. If you want to rise up, you have to go down on your knees. A lot of kneeling will keep you in good standing. If you want to rise up, the first thing that happens is the people of Israel begin to seek God. They begin to devote themselves to God. Diligently, they begin to seek God. I'm very positive that, you know, many of us in the last 21 days of fast, you have very diligently, you have, you have vowed, you have devoted yourself to seek God. I think that is the beginning of a miracle. That is when God begins to move. Why God hasn't moved for 20 years? Because nobody sought the Lord like that. When, the, when their hair locks go untrimmed, when people have taken a vow, when people have devoted to seek God, when people have offered their lives willingly to God, God has risen on behalf of the people. God will rise on behalf of you when you make that devotion to God, when you willingly offer yourself to God. God saw that. God saw the people crying out to God. See, that is what God can single-handedly vanquish the enemies, right? We know that. It's a, that's what happened in the story. It makes no sense. Now, now Reuben and, and uh, God and Asher would be thinking, why, you know, you don't need us. Sometimes we really wonder, does, does God really need our help? I mean, nobody, it, it was a supernatural, divine miracle, right? All of a sudden, a, a stream, you know, a, a river turned, turned into a raging torrent and there was a cloud burst and all those chariot, iron chariots got stuck in that mud and they couldn't run and they couldn't drive. They just, it's, it's supernatural. The people didn't do nothing. The Bible says here, listen to this. The Bible says here in verse 23, let the people of Meroz, chapter 5, verse 23, let the people of Meroz be cursed, said the angel of the Lord. Let them be utterly cursed because they did not come to help the Lord. Does the Lord need any help from us? Does it make any sense? They did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty warriors. Why does God need my help? I mean, at the end of the day, just that one word, he can turn the tide against the whole 900, you know, warriors. God can single-handedly do it. But you know what? He wants to see our faith. That's why he needs us. God cannot work in your life if you don't show faith. If you don't have faith. If you say you're willing to give your life to God, you need to have faith to believe in God. That's what it, that's what it means. That's why God is saying, you did not come to help me. Why does, does God need our help? No, he doesn't need our help. 
then why is he so concerned about Reuben sitting, you know, Gasher, you know, Asher sitting in the seashore, you know, looking after his harbor? Why God is concerned? Why God is saying, you guys did not join me? Because God is saying, I want you to have the faith to believe. I want you to see your faith. Always, remember, always, God moves when he sees our faith. When God wanted to open Jordan, God said, I'm going to take you across Jordan, but let the priests first go and keep their feet on the waters. Why do the people, why does the priests have to keep their feet on the water? Can't you do a miracle without the priests going and keeping their feet on the water? The Bible says Jordan means descender. On the, at that time, Jordan was overflowing at all its banks. The current was so heavy. The water was flowing like a rushing mighty torrent. And God says, the priests carrying the ark should first go and keep their feet and then I will open. It's a, it's a step of faith. You need to trust God. It was Moses was taking the children of Israel, you know, out of Egypt. And at some point of time, it was like between the devil and the deep ocean. Pharaoh's chariots are right behind him. And then the Red Sea. And God said, take them to the Red Sea. People are, are you, are you going to, are you going to make us all drown here in the Red Sea? He took them right in front of the Red Sea. They can't escape. And God said, now go, go where? Into the Red Sea. It's a step of faith. And then God opened. Now imagine all those stories in the Bible. God expects the people to have faith. When you say you're, when you say you're willing to offer yourself to God, you need to have the faith. You need to have the faith. Right? So what happens when you don't offer yourself willingly to God? When you have some reservations. When we don't offer ourselves wholly and willingly to God. It's an important lesson. It's an important lesson that we all need to understand from the story of Barak. Barak was the leader. You know, God told Barak to go and fight the battle. Just one verse. I'm just rounding it up. I'm just finishing my sermon. One verse. Four. Judges 4 verse 8 to 11. Judges 4 verse 8 to 11. Now God is calling Barak and saying, go bring the army. Let's go and fight. Sisera. Barak told her, I will go, but only if you go with me. Only if you go with me. Who should come with him? A woman. He's calling a woman to come with him to go and fight against Sisera. I don't know why in the world he asked her to join. Now God is saying, you go and fight. He's saying, I will go only if you come with me. Well, very well. That's what she says. She replied, I will go with you, but you will not Receive your honor for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be in the hands of a woman. Unbelievable story. A great warrior, a great leader of 900 chariots dies at the hand of a housewife. Why? Because the man said, I am not willing to go. Very well. If you are not willing to go, you will lose the honor. I will hand over Sisera into the hands of a woman. At Kadesh, remember, I mean, these words are very important, these names. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. What is that place? Kadesh. Kadesh is the place. That Kadesh is Barak's hometown. So that's where they gathered all the army. It's an important story for all of us to remember, people of God. Sisera jumped from his chariot. And ran for his life. You know where he ran? He ran to Kadesh. The very place where Barak's house was. But you know where he ran? He ran into Jail's tent. Her tent was also in Kadesh. Look at, look at the coincidence. Look at how God spins the story. Look at the hand of God. The wisdom of God. Barak's house is in Kadesh. Jail, the woman, her tent is in Kadesh. Sisera runs and comes to Kadesh, but he goes into Jail's tent. Barak's run coming, runs after, he runs and chases and finally comes and asks Jail, the woman, where is, where is Sisera? Well, he's inside, I'll show you. He goes and shows him, there he's dead. Who killed him? Jail. 
he lost his honor. So close in the same place, very close to him, but he lost his honor. What happens when you don't willingly follow God? You lose your honor. God passes over you. You missed your opportunity. Right? So God is looking at his people and saying, "When if you want to experience, if you want to experience my power, if you want to experience my miracles, if you want to rise in strength, if you want to rise above your circumstances, if you want to receive your share of blessing, then you willingly offer yourself to me. I will make sure, I will make sure that you will be a people who will rise in power and glory. Okay, so that's all my sermon for you this morning. Few pointers for you. Number one, you know, quickly I'll run through. Miracles are reserved for those who are truly devoted. Listen to this carefully. Miracles are reserved for those who are truly devoted to God. You need supernatural divine intervention. It is not for everyone. It's not for everyone. If you, are you willing to dedicate yourself totally to God? Are you willing to wholly offer yourself to God? Or do you have reservations in your life? God doesn't work according to your terms. God works according to his terms. He says you want to follow me and you follow God. And that's when God will reveal his glory. So miracles in your life are, are based on to what extent you are willing to devote yourself to God. Number two, don't just be a spectator. Don't stay in the sidelines. Be on the front line for God. Don't be a Reuben. Be a Zebulun. There is a difference. There is a difference. I want to say this to you, right? Just to be, sometimes we say God is not a respecter of person. God loves us all equally. God doesn't favor. No. If you need God's favor, you need to be on the front line. There is a difference between a Reuben and a Zebulun. There is a difference between a man who is unstable. The Bible says a man who is unstable in all his ways, he is like a wave that is tossed by the wind. And, you know, he can, let, him not, let, him not, let him not expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. That's what the Bible says. A man who is unstable like a water. There is a difference when God looks at you. He wants to. He knows. He knows where you are. He knows why. Why there is an indecision in your life. He knows that why you are so so settled with your with your own life. Why is that you are you are very comfortable and you don't want to move out of your comfort zone? God knows all of that, right? And you make your choice. You either be a Reuben or you be a Zebulun. And a man receives his reward to the extent he is willing to offer himself to God. So when because when God is at work. He wants you to be on the team, right? Number two, so God doesn't want us to be on the sidelines. He wants you to be on the front line. Zebulun and Naphtali were on the front line for God. And God gave the victory. They didn't have to do much. But God wants you to be. That is favor. If you need favor from God, you better be on the front line. You hear me? If you need favor from God, you better be on the front line. Number three, there is a there is an interesting Latin word. Carpe diem, carpe diem, C A R P E D I E M, which means seize the moment. Seize the moment. Sometimes, you know, God moves at a particular season. Seize the moment. When God is moving, seize the opportunity. Don't miss it. That's what it means. It depends on the choices that you make in life, right? Barak, Barak lost the moment. Jail, the woman, the housewife seized the moment. Somebody lost the moment, he lost the honor. But the other person sees the moment. The Bible says, read, blessed is jail among all women. Who was jail? She was not even an Israelite. Do you know that? She was not even an Israelite. She was neither a Canaanite. But a, but a, but a choice came into her life because the, the Sisera, the, the leader of the Canaanite army, came running into her tent and said, I want to hide here. Will you please help me? She made a choice. She said, I'm going to seize this moment and I'm going to nail this guy because I'm going to pledge my allegiance to the God of Israel, not to the Canaanites. There were two people. She was living in the, in the midst of two, two different nationalities. The other side, there were Canaanites and the other side, there were Israelites. She was neither a Canaanite nor an Israelite. She just seized the moment. She just seized the moment. She said, I will pledge my allegiance to God. Made a choice. Right. So you make a choice. You miss 
the opportunity came. Why Barak? Why Barak? Barak is one of the contemporaries of Joshua. God knows why God is calling Barak. Why God's word came to Barak and said, go lead the army. He said, no, I won't go if, unless a woman comes with me. Oh, very well. I'll pass the honor to a woman. You seize the moment. You lose the moment. You lose the honor that God has for you. Finally, if you love God unreservedly, if you love God. Now, I think we come back to that last verse. Love God. Those who love God will rise in strength. If you love God unreservedly. I know that love, the word love is just an overused word. And we say we love God. But let me be very clear what that text means this morning. Those who love God will rise like the sun that shines in its strength. Do you really love God? If you love God, then you will be a person who will be willing to offer yourself to God. If you love God and reserve you. God is saying, my people will rise from the gloom to the dawn. It could be whatever circumstances in your life, whatever has caught you, you know, made you, you know, you stagnant in your life, or whatever has challenged you, or it could be a season of distress or, or something. It could be an enemy. It's like, it's like a huge mountain. It could be something that's so intimidating. But God has said, you will rise. You will rise in power and in strength. If you, if you willingly offer myself, yourself to God. But that's the message I have for you this morning, people of God. When people willingly offer themselves to God, God performs supernatural miracles. That's what happened. And I'm sure there are people who are honored by God because they made a decision to follow God. Right. So may the Lord bless you this morning. I believe that this is the message that God has for you. I believe that the word has spoken to you. So may, may, may we, including me, may we all love God. May we be willing to offer our lives to God wholly, completely.